Coming up, is money the key to happiness or is it the other way around? Joining me today to answer this is Zappos CEO, best-selling author and part-time poker player Tony Shea. Plus, what companies do customer service the best? I'll give you my top five and my worst. Don't move, it's the Annie Duke Show. Welcome to the Annie Duke Show. I'm your host. This week I'm Annie, not John Landau. Helping me out and interacting with you, our viewers throughout the show, is Brian. You're not in the corner. Well, you're in the corner of the couch. I am in the corner <laughs> of the couch. I've, I've graduated to, to the couch. Well, I always want you over here, and whenever there's a space kind of over there, you're still, you, I think you're comfortable. I like, I like the corner, but today I, I, I'm excited to have Tony on the show. I know, right. And, and I just wanted to sit close to you. You, you look pretty today. You got, a new, you got a new hairdo? I did. I got my hair did. So this is, people now know the secret because I'm, I'm very busy, as you know. And so unlike most girls, I only get my hair did like once every six you, months. I get it like done twice a year. You so. got it, you got it did good. I did. So, so when I get my hair done, I get it sort of dark brown, as you can see. Here's the dark brown. And so the color that you saw last week, which was red, is secretly my natural color. So you're just very girly. You got the engagement ring. I got it back finally. We've been talking about this for weeks, right? So we went and got it sized, but it turns out it's still slightly big. However, I am not going to set it back to get it resized because I don't want to wait that long. Yeah, again and it's just the it. cold weather. It will, when it gets hot, it'll right, we'll get Right, better. exactly. Yeah. But I'm very excited to have my ring back. And that was Valentine's Day yesterday. And yeah, I saw Joe. I did. I've, I've got the phone out because Joe tweeted that only Annie Duke would spend hours in a CVS to get the worst card ever. I'm not sure that everybody understood that I did that on purpose <laughs> and that he really appreciated it. I think maybe people thought he was dissing me. So you bought a tacky cheesy, I love you. I did, so I'm going to read it to you because I bought it for the poem because the poem was so bad. And I, I can't, it's hard for me not to laugh while I'm reading it, but it says, it amazes me that out of the whole world I would find the one person who would make my life complete and that we were both at the right place to meet, notice that rhymes, <laughs> and, the, and at the right time in our lives to fall in love. And once again, I realize that our love was truly meant to be. Wow. Is that, that's like the, that's the then worst. you signed just Love Annie or? I signed it. Um, well, so. In <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just opened up another. Uh... No, I, I put a little heart and then I put my name. And then Joe and I, instead of saying XOXO, say XXF. <laughs> so. I like that. So that's what it said. But see, now I'm blushing. Um, is that not the worst freaking poem? <laughs> like, who? You have to understand, somebody had to write that and then, like, show it to their boss at the card company who had to be like, let's go with that for the Valentine's it's card. I'm a little confused by that. Pretty bad. How was your Valentine's Day? It was. Uh, it was. Did good. you play I, racquetball with Joe Seabock? I did. Something? I worked and I played. I played racquetball. But every day is Valentine's Day in my house. So. <laughs> every, it is. That's a good. Save. But my wife, uh, Eric and I don't do cards. Yeah, we but don't. you didn't go out to dinner, romantic no. dinner, or anything. No, she made. Valentine's I came back from racquetball and, we, and she had salmon, and spinach. Are those aphrodisiacs? I don't know. I think so. You think so? It was delicious. Well, I was, my Valentine's Day was, we, we, uh, I was very, very sick all weekend, as people who follow me on Twitter know. I got some food poisoning on Friday, uh, and I was really deathly ill, like almost went to the hospital on That's... Sunday morning. It was really bad. So uh, by the time Valentine's night rolls around, I'm finally feeling better. We go to dinner. I'm very energetic on the way to dinner because it's like the first time I'm going to eat right. uh, since like Friday. And... Um, by the end of dinner, I really had faded because I was still very worn out from being sick. So we got home. I was like, I'm going in the bedroom. Joe was like, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And by the time he was there, I was asleep. So that was our problem. <laughs> I have to make up for it tonight. Anyway. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm really excited about my guest today, Brian. I am too. Yeah. So you know where I met this guy? So this, today we have founder and CEO of Zappos and best-selling author Tony Shea, but one thing that people don't know about Tony is, do you know where I met him? This is a tri trivia question. I think it was on The Apprentice? The for Apprentice. One the, for one of the uh, challenges. Yes, for one of the challenges. This is, this is where I met Tony Shea, 
And it turned out, so I met him on there, uh, and then he knew a very good friend of mine who I think, do you know Emily Gillette? Uh, no, no, just know from... Yeah, so from he, he knew a very friend of mine, and then she knew that, so anyway, then we ended up having dinner and whatever, we became friends. Very cool. Any, That's any, one of the only good things that plays, came out of that Donald Trump thing. And he plays poker, too. He does play poker. He does play poker. So he came to one of my camps. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So in a, just a second, we're going to be talking with Tony via Skype about how he turned Zappos into one of the leading online retailers uh, with over a billion dollars in annual sales. I, Those I, shoes sell well. There's six Zappos boxes in my living room right now. Hey, whoa. Eric is trying to find the right pair of shoes for work. Oh, okay. And um, also, you know, he's very into corporate culture. So we're going to talk to him about how he's created a corporate culture that consistently sees uh, Zappos ranked as number one in the best companies to work for. Um, we're also going to talk about his New York Times bestselling book, which I have on my Kindle. I no longer have hard copies. I do have a hard copy of this book, but it's like a special signed version. So I, I like that you just called in. that your Kindle. Well, it's it is. Your, yeah, it is. It's your iPad with the Kindle app. With my Kindle app. Called Delivering Happiness. I know. If, don't know if people can see. Oh, they put it up on there, which will make it better. Um, which was number one on the New York Times bestseller yes. for like 11 weeks. Did you know that? I, I think I did. And he wrote it in like two and a half weeks. I need to figure out how to do that because I took two years to write my last book. He took two and a half weeks to write his. I took two years to write mine. Um, and maybe, maybe we'll talk a little poker too. I like but it. and we're also gonna we're also gonna talk about um, later in the show the five companies that I think are best at putting customers first. Hopefully we're going to get Tony's uh, input on that. You'll chime in. Hopefully viewers will chime in via the Ustream chat. Uh, and you can tell me which companies you think have the best customer service as well. And feel free to tell me which ones you think have the worst, because I certainly have a strong opinion about that. But before we go any further and before we start talking to Tony, Brian, can you tell our audience? I can. Which I wonder how much audience we have, because normally we do the show at 6, and today we're doing it at 5. It's an hour early. And next week, are we doing it at 4? Uh, we're off next week. In the following week, we're back. Oh, we're off we're next, off next week. week, but back March 1st with Josh. Off next week, back March 1st with Josh. Am I in town March 1st? I'm not in town March 1st. How are we going to do that? We'll have to find out. <laughs> I, think, I think that I'm at TED. We'll, we'll have to look at that. But viewers, to uh, ask a question, I'm assuming one of these are my cameras, just uh, ask away in the Ustream chat box and uh, we'll get to it. Awesome. And then we'll figure out our scheduling difficulties for the next two weeks. Uh, Tony. How's it going? Where, where are you? You've got like beautiful greenery behind you. It looks so pretty. Where, where, are, you, where are you Skyping from? Uh, I'm actually sitting at my desk in Las Vegas. And so uh, let me see if I can give you a little bit of view. I sit in Monkey Row, so it's kind of a rainforest type of theme uh, and each of the aisles are decorated. Have you taken a tour of our offices? I haven't. You were uh, The last oh. time I was there you were going to give me a tour but something came up and I couldn't get over there. But I need to because I want to know how it is you're working in a rainforest. It's very beautiful. Yeah, each of the rows, the, the different rows, they decorate it themselves and, uh, and so there's all sorts of different designs and the conference rooms are each designed differently. We have one, like the one closest to me has um, skateboards and snowboards and so it's literally a boardroom and uh, <laughs> I like that and then we have one that's uh, you know theme like a zen like theme and, and so people just come up with whatever they feel like so so the employees who are working in a particular area get to decide what their decor is going to look like yeah and it changes when they get bored of it it changes to something else you, you should actually anyone uh, not just you should come for a tour if you go to uh, we actually offer tours to the public Monday through Thursdays, and we'll even pick you up from your hotel or airport in a Zappos shuttle. Tour takes about an hour, so if you just go to tours.zappos.com, you can sign up right there. I'm so going to do that. Isn't that cool that this it's, is... So this is inside, even though it looks like you're sitting outside. Yes. Did you decide on this theme? Uh, yeah, I think I was inspired after I went to... Um, Rainforest Cafe one day uh, and, uh, and thought, oh, that'd be cool. And so there's actually, um, I don't know, it's kind of evolved over time. I'm just looking around right now, but there's monkeys hanging out down and uh, bananas and, I don't know, random random plants and stuff. What are the, what are the colored ribbons by your head? Uh, oh, okay, so this is, let me see if I can tilt it up a little. So this is a 
So everyone has above their desk their name. Okay. It's a that's a license plate. And actually, when you first start at Zappos, it's uh, it's kind of like, you know, when you get a when you need get a new car, you don't have an actual real license plate. You get a piece of paper that has your name on it. Oh, okay. And then and then at the end of your first year, you get a license plate. And then each year after, we give you a little sticker that tells the people how how many years you've been here. So you know, just like renewing your yeah, uh, like your little registration side. sticker. Yeah, but but the ribbons were I think those are actually left over from December when uh, it was my birthday and I came back and there were ribbons and um, and bottles of Grey Goose and everything all over my desk. <laughs> That's Which nice. Which actually I still have. See, here's there's one of them and and then someone actually just handed this on my desk. I don't know if you can tell it's kind of a weird color and um, yes this one has a habanero in it so I'm a little scared to try that one. Now where, where are the ones because I read that when you were writing the book Delivering Happiness this is one of the secrets to him having done it in two and a half weeks which I'm so impressed by that you were putting coffee beans in <laughs> vodka bottles in order to try to stay awake so that you could write it. Where are the ones with the coffee yeah. beans in them? Uh, so yeah, so I talked to different writer friends of mine and you, you know asked them. So what, for me, I found it was really easy to write once I was in the mood. The hard part was getting into the mood. And so, uh, based on asking writer friends, uh, tried coffee, tried uh, wine, tried vodka, and then one night decided to infuse vodka with coffee beans, which actually was really good the first night, and then was really gross the second night. Then I couldn't finish it. But I actually found the best. Um, the best thing was actually Excedrin uh, when you don't have a headache because Excedrin actually still has uh, a ton of caffeine in it and it gives you, I guess when you don't have a headache, or at least it gives me a little high to, and then I'm just like, can bang out stuff really quickly. You should, have you ever, you know, when I was in high school, I used to do no-dose. Do you remember no-dose? I, I did. I did that in high school along with, uh, I, I, I remember I once did that with a two liter bottle of Coke or Pepsi, and that was not a good idea. <laughs> so, so when the kids are coming up to you saying, Mr. Shea, I admire you so much. What are your tips for writing? <laughs> and you're like, well, kids, I suggest you try some vodka and coffee. Yeah, I get high on Excedrin. <laughs> I get high on Excedrin. No, it's all about Excedrin. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if you ever actually, uh, if you ever look at the ingredients of Excedrin, it's coffee, uh, aspirin and Tylenol. So if you're right. ever, and for me it works wonders when you have a headache. So if you're ever out of Excedrin, you can actually make your own. Like sometimes I'll just take an aspirin and a Tylenol and then down it with a Red Bull and it's the same thing. It's the same thing. There you go. <laughs> wow. That's why it's supposed to work so well for migraine. I think caffeine's supposed to be good for migraines. I'm sold. I needed to be doing that because it took me two years to write my stupid book. I'll tell you what. But I appreciate that you did it in two and a half weeks. And managed, ho hopefully I'll have the same kind of results as you. So I want to, so, so for people who don't know about you, you've actually founded two different companies aside from being a best-selling author. So, uh, you know, I, you went to Harvard. And, and when you were at Harvard, what, was the, I, did you go there thinking, I want to be an entrepreneur? I want to be somebody who's, who's creating uh, uh, you know, amazing products and, uh, you know, amazing companies, or, or did you go there with a different sort of life plan? Uh, yeah, well, gro I guess growing up, I've always been pretty entrepreneurial, except, uh, you know, even as a kid, I talk about in my book how I started out with a worm farm idea to raise earthworms and, and sell them. But for me, I guess the motivation in the beginning was really more about just, I guess, and for my Myself, it was kind of my way of rebelling against my parents because they wanted me to become a doctor or get a PhD and so on. And so I guess I thought being an entrepreneur was a way of just you know setting my own schedule and doing what I wanted. So in college, I ran a pizza business. Uh, and then after college, it was during, this was back in 1996 during the whole dot-com boom, um, I co-founded a company called Link Exchange, which we grew to about a hundred or so people, and then ended up selling the company to Microsoft two and a half years later. But what a lot of people don't know is the real reason why we ended up selling the company, and it was because it just ended up not being a fun place to work at anymore, and the company culture had gone completely downhill. And I, I think you know we were fresh out of college and hadn't really run a real business before and so we just didn't know any better to pay attention to company culture and um, by the time we got to a hundred people uh, I myself dreaded getting out of bed in the morning to go t 
to the office of my own company, which was, you know, definitely a weird feeling. So now, that's did really... you did you feel like? I mean, obviously, you you were running the company. First of all, I'd love to hear sort of what mistakes do you feel like you made along the way, but also why did you feel like you couldn't fix that and and change the company culture as opposed to selling it? Yeah, I mean, the biggest mistake was in hiring. We we just we actually I think did a decent job of hiring people with the right skill sets and experiences, but. Uh, a lot of them weren't great for the company culture, and we ended up hiring uh, an outside CEO and outside uh, senior management, and so, uh, so so I wasn't really uh, in charge anymore either. So okay. that's why I felt that way. Um, but it was during the whole you know dot com boom, so it worked out well financially, and put me in a position where I was really thinking about okay, what is it that I really want want to do with my life now that you know, in theory, I didn't have to work anymore. Uh, and I thought, oh, investing would be fun. So invested in about 20 or so different internet companies and SAP was just happened to be one of them. And, uh, you know, had, didn't really think anything too much about it at the time the investment was made. But then over the course of a year, I realized that for me, investing was actually kind of boring. I felt like I was sitting on the sidelines and I really miss being part of building something. So, uh, Within a year, ended up joining Zappos full time. It was my favorite company out of all the companies we had invested in. Really liked the people. Uh, so, so, uh, so yeah, I, I'm actually not the founder of Zappos, but uh, but you know have been with Zappos from almost the beginning. So, for, first of all, for people who don't know, can you just say what Link Exchange did, so people know what that company was about? Uh, it was basically an online advertising network. Uh, we had this was back in the early days of you know, the, the whole internet thing. And so uh, back then there weren't ads on a lot of websites, which you see everywhere now. And we had about a million uh, members that were either small businesses or hobby websites or uh, websites like the Madonna fan page. And basically we would cause ads to start us showing up on their website in exchange. They themselves would get advertised for free on other websites. Gotcha. <laughs> and how did you monetize that? Uh, and so it was a two for one exchange, meaning that for every two ads you showed, we would show you one ad, we would advertise you one time somewhere else. So uh, across a million websites, let's say, uh, I, I think at the time we sold, we were doing about 50 million ad views a day. Uh, so half of that, 25 million, was being shared amongst the members, and the other 25 million we basically had inventory for that we could sell to uh, places like companies like Toyota or. Miller or whoever, and uh, and the pitch to them was, you know, you get to show up on a million different websites, and collectively, our reach was actually more than Yahoo was at the time. Gotcha, gotcha. That's a great idea. <laughs> and then these little websites who wouldn't have the money or or the wherewithal to be able to advertise had a place to get their word out as well. Right, and it was free for them. Right. And so so the the pitch to them was. Uh, you know, you can't advertise anywhere else, but these big companies like Toyota are f basically funding the service, so you get the exposure for free. Yeah, that's a great idea. Is it? Does it still exist? Uh, so Microsoft acquired it, and then, although from my perspective, they acquired it for kind of a weird reason. Um, at the time, they were trying to launch their uh, small business network, and a third of our websites were small businesses, so they saw more. They thought the value was more in the fact that we had 300,000 something uh, small business email addresses and they kind of just ignored the ad network and eventually <laughs> shut it down. That's so weird because that's such a great idea. Because who would spend money to... Does, that, does, anybody, does anything like that, did anything like that come in and replace it? Uh, no, I mean there were other copycat uh, companies but, but we were by far the largest. Yeah. And What's kind of funny about it today, though, is actually because uh, all of them had a link back to linkexchange.com uh, underneath the banner, and so uh, today, in because this was Google didn't exist at the time, but today, you know, linkexchange.com, if it was still around, would have been one of the most highly ranked websites on Google because there were a million other websites linking to it. So that's that another so, weird thing. So fun! It's like leave it to Microsoft to kill something so good. <laughs> That and, really uh, benefited everybody. That was such a great idea. Yeah, and then the other little weird trivia fact from there is, um, so my own personal homepage was website number uh, one in the yeah. network. 
uh, website number 16 out of 1 million was eBay. And so wow. we actually believe we helped you know, create this system back and forth where uh, we helped eBay grow and they helped us grow and, and so on. I, so, so eBay was getting its ads out so people would come when it was a very small site. And then that's really interesting. And now it just doesn't exist. That seems, I don't know. I'm sad about that. Anyway, and it okay, wasn't so, even called eBay. It was called Auction Web at the time. You know, I remember that because my stepfather was really into it. He's been with eBay since the beginning when it was called Auction Web and was very into it. He makes first day covers. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. But first anyway, aid covers? First day covers. Oh. They're like envelopes with, I, never mind, it's esoteric. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so, so you have this experience. You found this company. The company culture goes south because you're hiring people for their skill set and ignoring the other things about the people. That's in your opinion. And, right. and while you certainly built a successful company, it wasn't a place that you were happy at. So then you thought, well, maybe I'm not a company man. I'll just invest. Then you figured out maybe you were a company man, so you go into Zappos. And when you went into Zappos, having learned from the mistakes of you know, Link Exchange, what do you go in with the idea to set out to do in order to not go down that same path? Well, it was, you know, technically I didn't have to work anymore. And so my thought process was, you know, what would I actually want to do if it weren't for the money? And, uh, and, and you know, one of the things is if I'm going to be at a company such as Zappos, then I want to go in and be around people that I would choose to be around even if we weren't in business together. And that's been kind of our philosophy you know, from, from the beginning is culture is, uh, all, has always been really important from the beginning because I definitely didn't want to repeat the same mistake I made at Link Exchange. And then you know, today it's our number one priority. And, and uh, it, I guess it started out for more selfish reasons, just for, for myself trying to think of what environment I wanted to go into. But over time, you know, as it turned out, it also works from a business strategy point of view. Uh, our whole belief is that if we get the culture right, then most of the other stuff like delivering great customer service or building a long-term enduring brand or business will just be a natural byproduct of that. Okay, so, so in the hiring process, how do you weed out the jerks? I mean, well, you're, so you're getting resumes based on skill set, right? Because you're looking for, when you're hiring, you're obviously looking for certain skill sets, right? Uh, it depends. A lot of our uh, our positions are actually entry level, and what we want to do is hire a lot of people entry level and then provide them with all the training and mentorship so they can become a senior leader in the company within five to seven years. Uh, and we end up hiring. You know, part of it, part of it is as we've grown and word of our culture has gotten out. Uh, and we also you know, made. Uh, we actually just found out we made the Fortune 100 best companies uh, to work for list for the third year in a row and so stuff like that helps uh, attract a lot of people and so we actually end up hiring just a, about one percent of people that apply so we've gotten lucky in terms of being able to really choose and you know we don't actually look a lot on resumes especially for entry-level positions it's really um, well for everyone we hire we do two sets of interviews the first set is the hiring manager and his or her team will interview for you know the standard stuff looking for fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit. And they have to pass both in order to be hired. So, so yeah, we've passed on a lot of really smart, talented people that even if we know they can make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line, if they're not good for our culture, we won't hire them. And if you do a Zappos uh, or a Google search for Zappos core values, you can see what our 10 core values are. And we actually have interview questions for each and every one of those core values. So what, just, just for us, <coughs> what's an example interview question? I'm going to have Brian. Brian, you're like interviewing. What's, a, what's an example interview question for Brian? Um, well, I'll give a couple examples. So, so the one that actually messes up, that uh, comes up the most often during the interview question uh, or during the interview process is um, in relation to our last core value, which is be humble. Uh, and you know, that's actually a hard one to actually <clears throat> ask a question for because you can't just ask someone if they're humble and they say, "I'm the most humble person in the whole wide world." <laughs> so. Um, but one of the ways we test that, I mentioned earlier about the Zappos shuttle. A lot of our candidates are from out of town. We'll pick them up from the airport in Zappos shuttle, give them a tour, and then they'll spend the day interviewing. Well, at the end of the day of interviews, the recruiter will circle back with the shuttle driver 
and ask how he or she was treated. And it doesn't matter how well the day of interviews went. If the shuttle driver wasn't treated well, we won't hire that person. Uh, it's not even a That's question. That's really smart. That's super smart. Um, super but smart. I, you get, wouldn't hire Brian then. He, I've never even seen really him tip nice. a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We'll, we'll get him on the shuttle and see. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, uh, so one of our other core values is be adventurous, creative, and open-minded. And one of my favorite interview questions there is, um, on a scale one to ten, how lucky are you in life? And one being, I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. And ten being, I don't know why good things always seem to happen to me. I'm like a ten. Well, lucky. I'm the, really lucky. The, well, we wouldn't want to hire the ones because they're bad luck, and yeah. we don't want bad luck to find its way to Zappos. Yeah. That would be good for business. Um, but that's actually a. Uh, there was a research study I read about where they asked that exact same question to a random group of people got all sorts of different answers and then afterwards the researchers had them do a task and basically they handed them a fake newspaper and asked them to count the number of photos that were in that newspaper uh, but because it was a fake newspaper sprinkled throughout were these headlines that would say things like if you're reading this headline you can stop the answers 37 collect an extra hundred dollars right. and what they found was the people that consider themselves unlucky in life generally never notice the headlines they just diligently went through the tasks they were assigned and you know eventually came up with the right answer whereas the lucky people stopped early and made the extra hundred dollars so the takeaway being it's not so much people are inherently lucky or unlucky but luck is really more about being open to opportunity beyond just right. how the task or situation presents itself see i feel like all i need to do the reason why i think i'm a 10 on the luckiness scale is because like i don't live in a refugee camp like clearly i'm lucky right because I was born here, I have a wonderful family, I have people who love me, I have great, like how could I not think I was a 10 on the lucky scale? Do you know what I mean? That's... I mean, you know, I mean I live in LA, <laughs> right? I don't... That's pretty lucky, just like, just to be born in America, it's just start there. Like that, right there you're already not a one. But, but even beyond that, there's the, some people get better job opportunities than other people. No, no, of course. Yeah, I understand so, no, that. I've always looked at it because I've, I've always had people tell me that I'm lucky and I've always said, well, I put my position, myself in a position. Right, which has it, that's, that's the same thing as a newspaper that luck, reading thing. Yeah. Or my wife, so what, my, my wife the, always calls it coolie What's coolie the luck. worst answer you've ever seen to one of your corporate culture questions? Is there like one <clears> that stands <throat> out where someone said something where you were just like, that's the worst answer that's ever been given in an interview? Um, I guess, uh, so I haven't done these interviews for a while. I used to interview for the first five years. I used to interview uh, everyone that that came in. But I would say That's the amazing. the the ones that are the biggest red flags are when asked about you know what's something they're uh, in their previous company or job that they were uh, proud of, and and you basically see how often the person uses the word I as opposed to we, and you know if they're always talking about I or my customer and so on, then uh, for me, that's a, that's a pretty big red flag. Right, right. So, so who at the, like, obviously you have the core values. Are these core values generating from something that you put together or you put that together with a team? I mean, there was already uh, a team in place at Zappos when you came in, right? Yeah, well, we actually didn't have core values for the first five or six years of the company. And I th it was one of those things that all of us, myself personally as well, I, I think kind of resisted in the early days because it felt like one of those big corporate things to do. And we didn't want that. And, and I think part of the reason we felt that way is because a lot of big, especially bigger corporations have these things called core values or guiding principles or so on. But the problem is usually they're very lofty sounding. They kind of read like a press release that the marketing department wrote and you learn, maybe learn about it on day one and then it just becomes this meaningless plaque on the lobby wall. And for us, we wanted to come up with committable core values and by committable meaning we're actually willing to hire or fire people based on whether they're living up to those values completely independent of their actual job performance. And right. when you use that criteria, it's actually a surprisingly hard list to come up with. And it took us a year, I basically just sent an email out to the company uh, in 2004, I think, and asked everyone, what should our core values be? Got a whole bunch of different responses back and went back and forth for about a year and then eventually came up with our list of 10. And how much do you feel like, I mean, you know, obviously in the end, there's a bottom line to watch. And if the core value, you know, if this idea of core values were hurting the company, it's probably not something that I assume you were con con 
continue because you have a company that still has to, you know, make money. But I, I assume that you feel like that's opposite the case. Have you ever been able to look at how much do you feel like the fact that you're running the company this way with, with a culture of people that all got along really well? Clearly, lack of selfishness is a really important piece of it, being cooperative with other people, understanding how to share success and those kinds of things. How much do you feel like that contributes positively to the bottom line? Have you been able to quantify that? Do you care to quantify it? Uh, it's, it's definitely hard to quantify. Um, well, let me answer the first part of it, which is about the trade-off between profits and w actually whether it's culture or customer service. You know, nobody wants to work in a company with a bad culture. So the question is, why don't more companies focus on it? And yeah. I think it's because the payoff is usually two or three years down the line. And most companies are being run, you know, trying to figure out how to maximize the, the financials of the current quarter or at best right. the current year. Um, and so it, that's really, really the, the trade-off. In terms of being able to, you know, quantify it directly, like, oh, if we have a, whatever, if we have a company event picnic or party, then that translates into so much in the bottom line. I think that's really hard to do, and that's probably why a lot of companies don't do it. But there's been plenty of research by... You know, for example, the book Good to Great by Jim Collins or Tribal Leadership, where they actually researched and studied what separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial performance from just the good ones or mediocre ones. And they found that the great companies had two important ingredients that the good ones or mediocre ones generally did not. And they were kind of surprised by their findings. And the first ingredient was the great companies all had very strong cultures. And um, and so there is that data if you look at it across, you know, and, and those great companies outperformed their peers over a long period of time. Well, I, there, I mean, it seems like there'd be another place where you could really see a concrete difference in terms of culture, which would be, um, I'm assuming, I'm just assuming that, that you're seeing much less turnover than a company that's similar to yours in size. Yeah, and yeah, definitely, uh, and it varies by department. But per, you know, if you compare our warehouse with other warehouses and so on, then yeah, there's less turnover. And, and there's also you know plenty of studies that show a link between employee engagement and employee productivity. And there's also research that shows that one of the best predictors of employee en engagement uh, is whether they have a best friend at work or the number of friends that they have at work, and that all goes back to company culture. Culture, right? So. I mean, for example, like, if you're a company that has higher turnover, I mean, what are the real costs for recruiting costs? What are the real costs for training costs, for getting somebody up to speed, so on and so forth? I mean, that those might be, you know, not necessarily hard quantities, but that has to contribute pretty seriously to, to bottom line in terms of what your, your resource costs are to yeah, make sure that you've got employees <coughs> that are working well. Yeah, so that's definitely part of it. But I think the biggest thing is just out of, employee engagement and productivity, right? Yeah. Like there's so many people in corporate America where, you know, they, they, I mean, when I was working mm -hmm. at, during my brief stint at Oracle, you know, I would, might have technically been in my seat at my desk, but that's the different, diff, that is different actually being productive. Right. And creative and thinking, you know, thinking outside the box and what not? I assume I assume that at your company, people don't hear. That's not the way we do things around here. I'm guessing uh, that's we, not a statement we, that comes out of your mouth very often. Yeah, I, I mean, unless it's the opposite, like uh, we're right. hiring this person that was mean to the shuttle driver. In which case, I'd say I might make that statement. Well, okay, but they don't. To be fair. No, but you want people to to be willing to think innovatively, to try to figure out ways to do things right. better, to make the systems better, to be more efficient. If you don't have engaged employees who feel like they're allowed to take those risks. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and one of our core values is to embrace and drive change. So yeah. things here are always changing. Does the I have a question? Does yeah. the uh, the shuttle bus drivers actually test people? Do they uh, put, or is it all natural? No, it's it's just natural, and usually it's the person on the bus, uh, you know, just asking questions like, "Oh, what's it like to work at Zappos?" and and so on, and. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's not stage. It's it's just whatever the conversation happens. Do your to shuttle be. bus drivers sometimes get promoted? You hire them instead. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so they yeah, we have something called um, used to be called help desk, and now it's called the can do team, where 
uh, they kind of rotate amongst different roles, including working at the front desk and being a shuttle driver, uh, and just basically almost like a concierge service for our employees. And so, uh, you know, some of them may. And one of the other things we encourage a lot is for employees to find their true passion. So, if they want to try out another department, we encourage them to move around. See that that's that's amazing. The feeling that you could. You know, because I know so many people who get really mired in a job where they feel like there's no room for growth, even if it's parallel growth, right? So, you know, I think mm -hmm. that a lot of people are like, well, you know, I've been in the same job doing the same thing forever, and it's not even a problem that I can't move upward. It's that I couldn't go try another job in the same company. Like, they wouldn't even let me move to go just try something new, even if it was a parallel move, right? So letting people know that if they want to go try to engage in something else, maybe they think they'd be better at, right? That that's available to them, I think, is really amazing. So, so another thing that I think is interesting, one of the things that I loved when I met you was that, you know, obviously, particularly at the time, although it's, it's more expanded to this, when I thought about Zappos, I thought, oh, that's a company that sells shoes, <coughs> mm -hmm. right? Sells shoes online, and, and that's really what I thought about as Zappos, but that's not a, at all the way that you think about the company, or even you thought about the company when it, it really was, that when shoes were really the main product of that company, although obviously you're selling a lot more now. Um, and I'd love to sort of hear what you, what you, the way that you think and the way that the, the people who work in your company think about what it is that you do and what it is that you're selling. Yeah, so internally we like to say we're a service company that just happens to sell shoes. And we're hoping, you know, 10 years from now people won't even realize we start out selling shoes online. And, you know, in fact today we sell a lot more than shoes. We sell clothing and handbags and beauty products, uh, housewares and kitchenware. And... Our whole goal is to build the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. Uh, and it actually doesn't even have to be limited to online. We've had customers email us and ask us if we could please uh, start an airline or, or run the IRS. And we're not going to do. But <laughs> I think ten or we need 20 years from. What? He's frozen. He's frozen. He's frozen. They'll get him back. We're going to let them get him back. I think Tony Shea should run the IRS. He could, or at least an airline, because we could, we could use an airline. Well, we're actually going to talk about uh, the airlines when we talk about the top companies, because one airline did, I know this is hard to believe, but one airline did make my top customer service company. Really? It, it really did. And let me just say, it's, it's not Delta. It's not Delta. So, by the way, I had Delta just say the greatest thing to me. We were, we, I was, we were, we were just taking, um, we were going from like New York to D.C., I think. And uh, so they keep delaying the flight, delaying the flight, delaying the flight. Finally, they get us on the, the plane, and then we taxi out, and then they bring us back, and they're like, uh, air traffic control won't let us take off. So we go, and they say, the next flight is at 6 in the morning. You know, by this time, it's like, you know, 9 at night or something. The next flight's at 6 in the morning. Uh, so we're like, okay, so where are you putting us up in a hotel? And they're like, oh, no, we're not responsible for that. This was their response. Like, we're not responsible for that. Um, I'm like, I'm sorry, how are you not responsible for that fact that I've been sitting here waiting for a flight for three hours? They're supposed to take off three hours ago, and now you've canceled the flight, and you're not responsible for that, even though your next flight is until 6 in the morning. And... The only thing they were going to do was give us, you know, put us, give us the ticket to the 6 a.m. flight. They weren't even going to give us a voucher or anything for the trouble. So, I, you know, basically I just called up another airline, and there happened to be another flight an hour later in the same airport. And I took that flight, and I have to tell you, way to go, Delta. Someone who, uh, someone who flies, like, like, I probably log, like, 100,000 miles a year. I never willingly book Delta now. It's Del Delta and AT&T are probably the two most yeah. hated companies that I see on like Twitter and right. Facebook. And just Although I have on. an AT&T guy at the AT&T store who's a poker fan. And he takes care of me. Interesting. So yeah. what is it, if, if you, Delta you hate, what is your favorite? Uh, airline? Airline for Southwest. customer service. Southwest. Interesting. And it's not even so much, I mean, first of all, so I've had to call Southwest occasionally, like before, uh, you know, a few years ago, before, like, I had my Southwest app on my phone, and, uh, you know, and the internet was um, as great as it was, but um, 
So Southwest, look, I like this. So I just want to say our producer keeps saying, let's throw to the top five companies. We've already started talking about that um, uh, until we get Tony back. The internet went down everywhere, by the way. Did you know that? So Tony, the internet went down. Oh, really? I can't see you, but I can hear you. Well, I, we, can, we can hear you fine, but okay. the, the, internet, the internet went down. Isn't that ominous? That's impossible. That is ominous. So we my were just my four year old says ominous every day. It's pretty funny. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, it's ominous. So we were, we, we were talking briefly about, because uh, we were talking about how you should be running an airline. And I was pointing out that the, the airline that I think has the worst customer service on the planet is Delta. Mm. Uh, and the airline I think has the best customer service is Southwest. Although Virgin's pretty good too, right? Yeah, they're I mean, new, th they're hungry. But what I like about Southwest is that you don't. Have to you don't have to deal with anyone there. Like if you want to change yeah. a ticket, you can just do it online. Like you almost don't. Yeah, I think need they have the best web interface, which is part of I think great customer service. Yeah. Is if you if you never feel that there's any customer service to be had, then I feel like that's part of great customer service. I mean, I'm interested. What do you, what do you feel like? I mean, obviously you have you have a company that has amazing customer service. It's really what you feel like you're selling. What do you feel like are the key components to great customer service? Uh, I think the most important thing is just the employees, making sure that you hire people that are actually passionate about giving great service and give them the tools to, to do that. You know, our, we run our call center very differently from most call centers, and most call centers, they have to follow scripts, and uh, they have to get supervisor approval for you know, refunding a customer above a certain dollar amount and so on. And so all those types of things take kind of the decision making and power out of the frontline reps and so their hands are kind of tied in terms of what they can and can't do and then they become unhappy and then uh, they stop delivering great service. So but do, have you I mean have you ever found that you know I assume that companies <laughs> who say that you have to get supervisor approval for a refund above a certain amount there's some sort of reason they do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, a, what's the reasoning and B have you found have you found that there's ever been problems with the with your reps, you know, over refunding people, or or do you think that it's possible to over refund people? I guess. No, it's definitely possible, and yes, it comes up occasionally. But uh, you know, we try to stray, stay away from uh, policies as much as possible because most company policies are to address the 0.1 percent situation for people at the inconvenience and expense of the other 99.9 .9 percent of people, and so why not? I love that. Yeah. And so, yes, it'll occasionally come up, and we may occasionally lose, you know, an extra couple hundred dollars, but then we'll just follow up with that rep and train them, or uh, if they're not the right fit for the company, then have them move on. But, you know, just address those situations individually instead of trying to come up with policies to protect yourself, you know, in, from the possibility. But if anything, we have the opposite uh, problem. Usually we find that our especially if they come from other call centers, our new reps are uh, maybe a little too stingy with our customers and we have to untrain their bad habits. See, I, I appreciate that because I feel like so many times I'm talking to a customer service rep and, you know, obviously I'm articulate, I'm explaining myself well, clearly I'm, so they should be able to make the decision to treat me in the way that I'm asking to be treated and they have to call a supervisor and I just want to pull my hair out. And then the supervisor comes on and gives me the answer that I want, but I've had to spend, you know, half an hour on the phone with yeah. someone arguing with them because they're not empowered to help me out. So I think we may have lost them again. The Internet's having, we need more, uh, we need better Internet customer service. We do. I wonder it's, who the provider is. Who's They're, the provider? It's probably, it's probably Tony's. The whole building has lost Internet connection. Oh, wow, so no one's even watching the show. It's Battle, <laughs> it's battle Los Angeles. I missed that earlier, so it, it's our connection. It's our connection. So is anyone, is it anyone actually... Uh, Can anybody watch us right now? This is really cool. This is like if a tree falls in the forest. All right, your top five companies. Okay, well, let me talk about... So Southwest... Customer service. The reason why I love Southwest is because I never deal with anybody at Southwest. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. So I go online, I book my ticket, I've got my frequent flyer thing, and this is one of the things that I love about Southwest, is the other airlines, and granted, I fly the other airlines probably more, because Southwest is really great for like flying to Las Vegas, but honestly, I don't really want to fly Southwest to New York if I right. don't have to. Um, but what I love is that the way that their uh, frequent flyer program works 
is that it's just after you book a certain number of flights, you get a free ticket. It's really super simple. So it's not like you, you get your points and then you've got to go and you look at this chart and it's really hard because it's only certain days that you can use the points for right. and different tic tickets or different numbers of points or whatever. It's just like you just fly a certain amount of time and then you get your ticket and that's it. And you can rack up tickets if you want. Like I had four tickets racked up for a while so I got to take my kids somewhere. And it's so easy and the, and the free ticket works no matter where you fly. So it's not like you're sitting there going, well, if I fly to New York, it's going to be something. If I or fly to Hawaii. Or get golf clubs with it. Or... I freaking hate that. Yeah. It's like, here, you just get a ticket. I think it's so much more simple. I like it. I, every, I love everything about Southwest, except for the cattle call yes. setup. But you know what you're getting. It's like People's Express from back in the old days. We've got Tony back. So my second, one of my second companies that I love for customer service is actually Amazon, which brings us back to Zappos. So I'm curious, because so, so recently Amazon acquired Zappos this past year, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was actually just over a year ago. So, so I, I, I've talked to Jeff Bezos before, and, and he, he speaks very similarly to you, that he feels like Amazon, which obviously started as a bookseller, that it really wasn't about books. It was... Uh, delivering amazing customer service and then you would build a great company no matter what you were selling and, and one of the things that people don't realize with Amazon is that they really revolutionized the way that shipping was handled so I think we all remember the days of four to six weeks for delivery mm -hmm. uh, you know and he had some sort of idea that that shouldn't be the way right so I mean there, there was really <laughs> a lot of innovation that happened there in terms of customer service and obviously Zappos was was doing the same thing and building a very similar culture around customer service. So here's my question, because this is the question I want to know from you. <coughs> Did Amazon is on acquire you because you have very similar sort of ethics about customer service and, and the way that you're supposed to handle the customer in terms of what you're growing? Or did they acquire you because they were afraid of you because you were doing such a good job and doing a sort of similar market kind of uh, experience that they were? So I, I want to know the answer. Um, I would say it's... Uh a little both or in a little bit of neither. Uh, so yes, both Amazon and Zappos were both very focused on uh, delivering a great customer experience, but our approach to it is uh, very different. You know, Amazon probably states that they're about convenience, low prices, and selection. Uh, so a lot of the focus is on pricing, whereas at Zappos we don't compete on price. We really want to compete on service. And so you might think of Amazon as taking the more high-tech approach and we're taking the more high-touch approach and in a lot of ways uh, you know just in terms of internally how we think about our businesses uh, Amazon is much more focused on the science of things and we're more focused on the art of things so uh, that's why it actually made a lot of sense for us to join forces because it's kind of, you know we can kind of learn a little bit from each other and kind of take the best of of both worlds the other di difference is that Amazon kind of looks at the customer experience from what I understand and and then everything is just about what's best for the customer that's the question they ask whereas our approach is really more for, about what's best for the culture and then have the customers experience and customer service stuff come out of that as a byproduct and so uh, whereas for them uh, uh, perfect example is uh, we applied uh, every year. You have to apply to be in the Fortune 100 best companies to work for list. Uh, we applied, and uh, they didn't, and because they believe that the time spent applying is time that could be spent making the customer experience better, or customer service better, or, or, or how they define their customer experience. And for us, uh, we applied because we think it's uh, you know it's a great thing to help take our culture to the next level and also attract other right. employees that want to be part of our culture. Right. So, so when you merge, obviously, you know, as you said, they're high tech, you're high touch. Do, do, are they coming in? Are they, are they working on the way you're, are they changing the way your interface works? Or are they leaving you guys to basically run the company the way that you were running it before and they just acquired you because they liked you mm -hmm. as a company and, and, and the revenue that you could bring for them and also it helped them because they acquired a competitor? Uh, so they've, I mean, the, as a precondition for even considering doing the deal, we told them we would only consider it if we could remain independent and continue growing the Zappos brand and our uh, culture and our way of doing business our way. So uh, that was a precondition, which is actually very different from most of their other acquisitions. Most of their other acquisitions, the plan is to integrate the company being acquired into the parent company and then eventually the original company kind of loses its identity and joins the mothership. And for us, uh, I think, they also 
saw that we were very strong in footwear and apparel uh, sales, and you know they had they actually tried to launch a competitor several years ago called Endless.com, uh, and also tried selling on their own site, but found that you know for whatever reason the approaches that they use towards the book business don't not everything translates into the soft goods business and you know a lot of that is also vendor relationships and uh, we're a very relationship focused company whether it's relationships with our customers with each other as employees or with our vendor partners I think a lot of that has to do with the way you think about Amazon too because I think about Amazon for stuff mm -hmm. and I don't put like shoes in the stuff category do you know what I mean like, I want to go buy books or electronic goods or video games, like st stuff. Yeah, I, I actually, and Amazon somewhat, to me, is almost like a shipping company. Yeah, so do you, they, I noticed that they've certainly expanded their kind of third-party seller right. business. Do you, does Zappos use third-party sellers as well? No, we no. we warehouse our own inventory, and that's the only way we can have control over the whole customer experience. And, yeah, and you want you know, to have really good relationships with your vendors as well. Right. And obviously, you can't do that yeah, if you have a lot can, of third-party sellers. You can feel that difference because when you buy, I, like I bought something recently from Amazon, like a camera, and the the camera came from one place, the lens came from another place. Right. And I felt like I was dealing with those individual. Stores and more Amazon and more lately, just... actually, that that's relatively new. How long? When? How? When did? I mean, Amazon seems to have really expanded that part of their business recently. That seems to be a recent thing. That I feel like a little bit like I'm dealing with eBay almost. Do you know what I mean? When I buy uh, from them. Yeah, I haven't uh, personally ex ex experienced that because when I shop at Amazon, I I specifically try to make sure I'm buying from Amazon, not one of the third parties. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you can't avoid it, though, you know, if it's a particular thing that you want. Yeah. But I think about, like, Zappos is where I'd go to, like, get shoes or clothes, something that would be about me or some, you know, something specific, whereas Amazon, I just go to, to get stuff. And I did for, uh, for Christmas, for, uh, I do, like, a kids in need, family in need program, and this a kid, they have their, their wish list, and the kid wanted shoes, pants, and a skateboard. Oh. And I, I went to Zappos, and they, they had all of it. Oh, that's great. So now cool. you 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 guys are have recently made you, obviously your core brand was shoes, but now you've you're you're expanding uh, away from that. How is that going for you? Do people still think of you mainly as shoes, or are 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 you successfully converting the way that people think about who you are? Yeah. So we've been making a big push into clothing, and uh, and and clothing is now a very fast growing part of our business, and. And definitely, it's you know taken some time for customers who haven't bought from us for a while to realize that we sell uh, clothing as well as other product categories. But what we found is once they try it once, just like you know in the early days when they hadn't heard of Zappos and were nervous about buying shoes online, once they try it once, then they kind of get hooked and tell their friends about. Them. The the last can I make a, the last thing I bought from Zappos? This is I got like a month ago. Um, with a pair of Jessica Simpson shoes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so Jessica embarrassed Simpson to say brand. that. The Jessica Simpson brand shoes. She actually makes really good shoes. I hate to say it, we lost them again. I hope we'll get them back again. Um, four, what's your other four? Okay, Amazon. Amazon. Because it's just so easy. It's easy to return. It's easy. And also, you kind of never deal with a customer service agent at Amazon. Right. That's what I think makes them good. It's kind of the same as Southwest, right? Like, part of what I think is really great about, you know, a company that has great customer service is that you sort of feel like you never have to deal with them. Right. You know, and I guess, Tony, do you feel like that, too? I mean, one of the things that I think is so great about Zappos and Amazon and Southwest, which really are among my top companies for customer service, is that... I've really never had to deal with the customer service there. Uh, yeah, well, what's interesting is actually, on average, every customer actually calls us at least once sometime during their lifetime. And it's usually not to place an order. And so if we get that one interaction right, uh, even though it might be you know once every three years or something, then it's something they remember for a long time and tell their friends and family about. So I think it's important to do make sure that you get as much right on the process side to avoid the calls in the first place but if something does go wrong or they just have a question or or, or have a special request then to make sure that you go above and beyond uh, so that they remember it. Um, what, what, what are your top five companies for customer service? 
Oh, I don't know if I can name five. That's a little. That's. Um, I mean, in terms, you know, there's the high end uh, places that serve the luxury market. So I'm not really counting those. Um, but in terms of places that deliver great service to the masses, um, on the West Coast, there's a, a chain called In and Out Burger. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so consistent, consist everywhere I've gone, great That's food. That's true. They never. Uh, friendly they're dry. I don't eat it, but my my. Fiance does the drive-through there. The customer service is like seamless. It has, and it, ha and it has to. It has to be about their culture. Yeah. Because it's. Do they have a good company culture? Uh, I don't work there, so oh. I don't know. But I mean, I would guess they yeah. do, uh, based on their employees are always happy and friendly and and know what they're doing. So. I love Blue Fly, too, which is a discount clothing realtor. They're great. They're so easy to return to. They never have a problem. You never have an issue with them. They, everything is displayed really well. I've literally never, you get it, if you return it, done. I don't think there it is right there, Blue File. Yeah. It's like you'd have to be a girl to know about it. It's like, do you, you must know about Blue File, Blue File, right, because they're in your space. Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. I've met their, uh, their founder, and um, I, don't, I don't know who the current CEO is, uh, but I've met people from there before. You should check. Their customer service is fantastic. Okay, okay, so so now, so anyway, you, you, you create this amazing company, you sell it to Amazon, blah, 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 and then now you're just a New York Times bestselling author. So, the, which is just, it's crazy, right? So, so you wrote this book in two and a half weeks. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, a lot of it was stuff that, I, I mean, it's kind of like if, uh, if you win a poker tournament saying you made all that money in, uh, in, Two and a half hours, uh, you know, it's really, you know, you've been playing poker for a very long time, and yeah. you know, a lot of the stuff that I write about in the book is stuff that I've already said in, you know, speeches and interviews and so on, and it's more just putting it to paper. So what? What? I mean, obviously, through the book, you're talking about your experience as an entrepreneur. The book is called Delivering <laughs> Happiness. I'd recommend it highly to anybody. Um, but you know, you're also a corporate speaker. What? I mean, obviously, you don't need to be sharing this. What? What is the what is it that you feel so pa passionately about that you really passionately want to share with people? Uh, it's really just this whole idea of spreading uh, this idea of happiness as a business model to other companies and industries and organizations. And so that, you know, part of that is done through the book. Uh, we also at Zappos have a separate entity and website called ZapposInsights.com. Uh, where it's the same type of thing. There's anything from a monthly subscription service to these one-day or two-day seminars where we help other companies develop their own strong cultures and figure out the values that are right for them. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's about, I guess, kind of the next level of it's gone, going beyond just making Zappos customers and employees happy, but really uh, spreading that to other organizations. And, and not even necessarily just companies, but we've... Uh, as part of the book tour, uh, went to, for example, Boston Children's Hospital, where they were really interested in uh, revamping their culture and uh, you know charities and even sororities, museums, and so on. And so it's been it's been pretty interesting all the feedback that we've gotten uh, from the book. There's even been moms that have written in saying. Uh, after reading the book, they now think of themselves as CEO of the household and came up with core values and so on um, for their company. So um, I actually have I like to run to, an, to another meeting. So sure. it's, um, it's at 6 o'clock, but I uh, just want to say thanks for, for having me on the show. Well, no, thank, thank you for coming on the show. It was really educational. I'm going to I'm gonna go have all, all my kids read it now so that I can be like, this is our corporation. <laughs> You should yeah. read it. I didn't think about it that way, but I should have thought about that way. I should have my core values for my household. I like it. I like that. Well, thank you so much. People can get, uh, can people buy Delivering Happiness on Zappos.com? Uh, actually, no, but you but can You should have to be able to buy it on Zappos.com. <laughs> they can buy it on Amazon.com, though. Yep. Uh, yeah, just go to Amazon.com slash Delivering Happiness. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for coming by. I'm so glad that we got you on the show finally. I'm going to be in Vegas this weekend. Hopefully, you should pop by the Nugget to the charity event that's happening on Saturday. Oh, Come I'm going to be out of town. But, oh. Uh, this keeps yeah. happening to us. We keep crossing paths. Yes. Well, the next time I'm there, next time you're here, we'll get together. Thank you so much for coming by, Tony. All right. Take care. We appreciate it. You, you've never used Bluefly. You should ask um, Erica. I will. She's probably, she's as uh, 
Zappos and Pipe, Piper, Piper Line? So here's the thing. The difference, the difference is Zappos is like a retailer, right? right? Blue Fly, if we should put up the graphic for them again. They're, they're so good. Blue Fly is everything is, is deeply discounted. So it's anywhere from 30 to 60% off. So you're not necessarily getting things that are brand new styles, but things that are like from last fall gotcha. or whatever. But it's really great because everything's in categories. You go through. If you order it and it comes and you don't like it, it you, it's literally just boom, send it back. There's no. It's so seamless. And and that's one thing I think. And I don't know if it's just because the technology can make things so 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 much better. But I feel like um, internet companies get customer service right better in general than brick and mortar companies do. They do. I start. I mean, Nordstrom's still good. Nordstrom's is great. Some of the department stores are still good. Um, but a lot of the big box stores just are horrible. Best Buy. Yeah. So, I, okay, I have to tell you my, my, uh, two of my worst customer service stories as we wrap. Okay. So, do you remember when you went to Animal a few weeks ago? Yeah. And, you know, Colin was taking pictures of it. Yeah. Colin's his brother. Okay. So, so, Joe really wanted to go. So, you know, I'm a vegan, so going to a restaurant called Animal seems a little weird, but in L.A., people always accommodate you, right? right? So we, we go there, and we're there with, with Joe and a friend of ours named Lisa, and the waiter comes up, and I'm looking at the menu, and obviously there's nothing that's particularly vegan on the menu, except there's a lot of vegetables on the menu, right? So there's, like, slaws, and there's broccoli, and there's a salad, and the only problem with the salad is it has some cheese on it, so I figure, okay, well, you know, I'll just be able to, like, get the salad. They'll take the cheese off. It'll be fine. So the waiter comes up, and I said, and I'm, I'm very nicely, I said, I know that this is going to sound really weird, but I'm a vegan, <clears throat> so I'm hoping, you know, I came because I, I love my fiancé and I love my friend, and they really wanted to try animal. So I'm, I'm hoping that since there's vegetables on the menu that they can, you know, just bring me some right. vegetables, right? And, and to the point where, like, I don't normally eat fries, but, like, I was hungry. I would have been willing to eat some fries. And they had a dish that was fries with just this, like, meat ragu on top of it. So you would assume they could just have made a plate of fries. Right. Right? This is the waiter's response. Are you ready? Oh, I'm sorry. We don't alter any of our dishes. I'm like, okay, well, there's, there's a salad here with just cheese. No, we don't. We don't alter anything. I mean, it's not that the dishes are made in advance. I don't want you to think that they've just been sitting there. But right. we, just, we will not change anything on the menu. And then he said to me, I could bring you some bread. <laughs> nice. So we won't be going back. I mean, they just literally lost customers. And, and I would have gone. I would have brought other people. I would have, you know, just because I'm not personally their customer, I know a lot of people who would right. be their customers. And I thought, what a crazy choice. Like, they could have just yeah, made a salad and restaurants take Restaurants the... still do that, a handful of them. Yeah. No, we don't, we don't change anything on the menu. I didn't have the bread, by the way. I was really pissed off. And then particularly when they brought the fry dish, with the, I was like, really? You couldn't have just brought the fucking fries? <laughs> really? Um, then the other one, have you ever had to deal with Facebook's customer service? No, not, not as a, uh, on the back end I have with, for some clients, but. Oh, my God. But not, not as a consumer. Well, one day, so one day I go to log into my Facebook account, and the, my password isn't working. I mean, but I know my password, right? right. So it's not working. So, um, so now I'm trying to figure out, like, who do I call at Facebook to fix this? Because I have a problem. I can't just ask for the password to be sent to my email because somebody else sent my, set my Facebook account up for me. And uh, they, they made a Gmail account that was right. Annie Duke official at gmail.com, and I happened not to have the password for it. Because, like, I never thought I would need right, it, right? Because, so I mean, I knew my password on Facebook, right? But somehow Facebook, like, had a little... Schwitz, I don't know, something died, and it didn't know my password anymore. So, uh, so I search around, and first of all, even trying to find out like what's a customer service email on Facebook. I challenge you, by the way, you need like an IQ of like right. seventeen thousand. I mean, I don't even. It was so hard. I finally find the thing. I email them. I explain the situation. I say, look, my name's Annie Duke. I'm emailing them from AnnieDuke.com. I right. want to just point that out. Um, my name's Annie Duke. I have this account. I have this problem, my password, something happened, my password just doesn't work. I can't just access the Gmail account because someone else set that up for me. Can you please help me, you know, if you could reset the password? We don't do that. And basically, and don't write us again. Because then I wrote them again. They're like, no, there's nothing we can do. And then they suggested to me, why don't you just open up a new account? 
And I thought, wow, that's amazing. They want people to open, open up multiple accounts just in case you're a predator, right? I thought, oh, they're suggesting, like, are, really? So now I talked to a friend of mine who happened to know one of the original investors in Facebook. Right. Okay? So she gets in touch with one of the original investors in Facebook who then gets me the email address of there's some celebrity yeah. email people at Facebook. I don't know this. It's not on the site. But anyway, they got me the celebrity people. So now I email them, and they're like, there's nothing we can do about it. If you can't, we suggest you go talk to Gmail. Okay. So while I'm still dealing with Facebook customer service, I now find someone who's invested in Google. <laughs> To now try to get the Gmail people to please give me, like, I'm thinking, what does a normal person do? Like, this is crazy, yeah, yeah. right? So they're sort of trying to get me somebody over there who can talk to me, who can reset my password over there, since obviously I, I can't get it. And because um, and they wanted to know, like, what's the name of the person who set it up? I'm like, I don't know, somebody at this company. So now, um, <clears throat> now the original and one of these investor people over at Facebook and me are both emailing this customer service rep saying, I'm emailing you from AndyDuke.com. Like, what do you think? So like, you just I couldn't went log in. into your... No, and I said, what do you think? I hacked into AndyDuke.com and then right. hacked over here to try to hack over here? Like, use your brain. And then I said, look, I'm going to tweet, right? This is what I said. I, my Twitter account is verified as Annie Duke, and my Twitter account is linked to my Facebook account. So I'm emailing you right now. You can see the timestamp, and I'm going to go tweet over on my Twitter right now, which will show up on my Facebook account that I can't get into my Facebook account. This is what I'm emailing to the customer That's service representative. That's because you, you hacked into the Twitter account. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. So I go and do that. And I say, now, if you look on my Facebook account, you're going to see it's updating, saying I can't get into my Facebook account, but it's updated by my Twitter account. And I emailed you in advance and said I was going to do that, and my Twitter account is verified. They were like, nope, can't help you. So what happened? Like, well, finally, the investor person is like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, she's writing you from AnnieDuke.com. She's doing this, she's doing that. And she must have, like, rolled some heads, because they finally wrote me back and were like, we reset your password. Uh, no, actually, I didn't even ask them to reset my password. I said, could you just reset it to... Fluffhead, you know, whatever, yeah. right? So they did that, and then I had my thing, and then they fixed it, right? So, so now I finally got it fixed, and the day afterwards, the guys from Gmail wrote me and said, we've reset your password. But I thought, what kind of company is this? Because I actually had to talk to the people who, like, own the freaking company to get yeah. it fixed. And what if you happen to be a person who doesn't know people who own the company? Like, how would you ever fix it? That's so well. And then I loved it when they were like, well, you should just open up another account. I was like, great, you want me to multi-account. That's really great. I think that's a great solution, Facebook. <laughs> so I, I, I think Facebook has, I Facebook. mean, ha, how have you been with their customer service? I think I've, it's the I've, worst. I've never dealt with them. Never dealt with Facebook. But the, but the online Facebook. companies are tough. The, I, I got to tell you, this was just like, this was the biggest night. I loved when I was like, and by the way, I want to point out, it was my brother's idea to go. He goes, why don't you email them? and then tell them that you're going to update your Twitter. Like, I like that. But I thought, wow, that's a really brilliant idea, Howard. So he calls me the next day and goes, did it work? I was like, no. And meanwhile, I had like four Scrabble games going with my brother, and I couldn't play them because I couldn't get in my Facebook account. <laughs> so I went and I did actually set up a temporary Facebook account just solely so I could play Scrabble with my brother. It's true. Who's on the show next week? But you said we're dark we're, next week. We're dark week. next week. Uh, when we come back, we have to figure that out in early March. We have Josh. Get my schedule, because I'm pretty sure that I'm at Ted. Let yeah, me they, see. It's March 1st, but Josh Klein, is it Josh Klein? Josh Klein, who wrote Hacking Work, which is amazing. And then uh, hopefully the Dan Band the week after that. We or hope Dan so. I'm at and Ted. And Kathy. Well, then I'll... I'll we'll, Touch we're going to have to reschedule, show. Joss. Um, yeah, I thought that we, had, we were on next week, dark the week after, and then on. Yeah, and then on. But, but we will definitely be back on March 8th with Kathy and Jimmy and Dan Frenity from the, from the Dan Band. Uh, if you don't know who the Dan Band, first of all, you should go look for them on YouTube because they're fantastic. But you would know them. They were the band that played, that were the wedding band uh, in The Hangover, and they were also in Old School, right? Yes. I think so then. The Todd Phillips movies. Anyway, they're fantastic. So we will see you either, I guess we'll see you in three weeks, two in weeks. In March. In March. We'll see you in March. Bye.